to say a few things about Equipies. Uh, maybe I will, I think it's okay like this. Let me just, okay, good. Um, first of all, this is our first webinar. Uh, so please be patient with us. We're all learning. Uh, this technology can be challenging, especially for me. Uh, so a few words about Equipies. Uh, if you don't know, Equipies is a very unique organization. Uh, we are based in three countries. We are a regional organization based in Jordan, uh, Israel, and uh, Palestine. And uh, we have been working on environmental issues and peace building for the last 25 years. Uh, we have created a very a highly effective models for people to pay people um, cooperation and dialogue on issues of regarding uh, the shared environment in this region. Um, in the last years, we have decided that the experience that we have accumulated during this uh, last 25 years, including all the best practices that we have developed, the lessons that we have learned during these years, uh, can be shared, can be shared with practitioners from other parts of the world that uh, are interested in uh, environmental peace building initiatives. And uh, we have created this uh, a new program, the program on water security with the aim of sharing uh, our experience, facilitating the exchange of knowledge and best practices among practitioners and create a network of practitioners, organizations that can support each other. So uh, with this intent, uh, we are now, uh, we have organized several training and workshops around the world, and we are continuing to develop new content, new tools, including uh, via via digital means, as this webinar shows. So this webinar today on, on the occasion of Earth Day uh, was thought with the idea of sharing important information and knowledge with our network. And we are very, very excited to open this series, Ecopia's Global Dialogues, with two renowned experts in the field of environment, security and conflict. So we have Dr. Uh, Benjamin Paul from Adelphi and Dr. Erika Weintel from Duke University. So welcome and thank you for being with us. We're really excited about your presentation. Um, and uh, uh, I want to uh, give you a little bit of information about the, our two uh, first speakers. So uh, Dr. Benjamin Paul is a senior project manager at Adelphi. I'm sure he's going to say a few words about Adelphi. He focuses on the impact of global environmental change on foreign security and development policy. is responsible for the topic areas of foreign policy, diplomacy, and water cooperation, and has been working for years at the interface of peace building and global sustainable development. So today, his presentation will focus on the, implement, on the, on the implications that the climate crisis has on security at the uh, national, regional, and global level. So I think I will just give the floor to the virtual stage to Dr. Paul for his first uh, presentation. So you have uh, 15 minutes. Uh, afterwards, we are going to have a few questions. Yeah, thanks so much. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to, uh, to present here on these interlinkages between um, the climate crisis and, and global security. And I'll just try to share my screen and I hope that works out. Just. It seems to work out. Yeah, uh, thanks and, and thanks for the kind introduction. And I, um, I want to say I started my career on, on foreign and security policy, uh, but have now worked on what environmental change means for foreign and security policy for quite a while. And it's been interesting, not only because um, uh, it's great to work on two uh, fear good issues at the same time. So, you know, building peace and security on the one hand and, and, and environmental protection on the other, but also because the, the two are actually quite, uh, quite interconnected as is what we are going to discuss um, today. Maybe just a few words on Adelphi, as, as Julia announced. Um, we are a think tank and a public uh, policy uh, consultancy, mainly based in Berlin, um, and are working on sustainable development um, around the world. And one of the uh, foci of our work has been uh, on the impact of environmental change for foreign policy. And so if we go straight in and look at, um, uh, at at what climate change means, uh, there's basically um, uh, two uh, two broad narratives. One is sort of a threat focused, and one is and, and one is uh, opportunity focused. 
Um, and the threat-focused narrative is uh, probably more familiar to most of you because um, it's easier to sell. Um, and perhaps also because we suspect that, um, that human nature is, uh, responds more easily to, um, uh, to threats. But it's very important to not, um, to not lose sight of the other uh, narrative. Um, and uh, so the first one, the threat-based narrative, is one that looks at um, how the climate crisis risks um, making um, violence more likely, more severe, um, and longer lasting. Um, and that implies the need to act both by, by limiting climate impacts through mitigation adaptation, but um, also by managing some, them so that they are less, less likely to, uh, to, to fuel violence. And then the second narrative looks at all the benefits that uh, such action to mitigate and adapt to climate change um, could generate. Um, and beyond the positive environmental impact, um, you know, for our health and economies and, and, and societies. But I'm going to focus a little bit on the first one because that's sort of more on the topic, but I won't forget the other one. So if we, if we start with uh, climate change as a security threat, um, the very basic thing maybe to start with is to look at how temperatures are evolving and they've been rising very quickly over the past few decades as this uh, graphic makes uh, very, uh, um, very easily clear. And, and Earth is now already warmer than, uh, than at any point in, 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 in modern civilization. And so this graph shows the, um, shows the uh, development of, of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And um, what, we could, what I want to say is basically that, uh, you know, human civilization unfolded over the past 10 to 12,000 years. And this coincides with the geological epoch, um, the Holocene, uh, which was remarkably stable um, climate-wise. Um, and actually, this very stability in the climate is uh, what defines this, uh, this, uh, the, this epoch. But in the past 50 years, um, we have changed that balance and we have uh, entered the Anthropocene. And to be honest, uh, the next uh, 50 years will probably then um, define the climate over the next um, 10,000 years. And the reason for this, um, for the scale of these consequences, um, are the number of, um, of tipping points that once they are activated, um, will likely be, uh, be, be impossible to reverse. So for example, once, uh, once permafrost is, um, is thawing and releasing loads of methane into the atmosphere, um, uh, the, you know, the process becomes self-reinforcing and the same is true once the deforestation in the Amazon rainforest uh, reaches a critical point and disrupts the, the, um, the evaporation there um, and the rainforest turns into, into a savanna. And if, let's say, one of the monsoons were to, to fail badly, um, you know, no one wants to be in the position of the governments of the affected countries um, because they simply depend on the monsoon uh, for their lives and livelihoods. Um, the question now is, is there, is there a uh, awareness of this existential urgency um, of the climate crisis? And the answer is yes and no. Um, on the one hand, yes, if you look at the, at the survey that the World Economic Forum is, is doing every year, um, sort of among the Davos set, um, uh, these elites certainly perceive the, um, the environmental change and its effects as both very likely and, and, and both very impactful um, in, in terms uh, of, of, the, of the risks um, it poses. So the top five risks by likelihood are environmental risks and uh, four of the top five risks by impact are also environmental risks. And the same goes for the, um, for the security risks of climate change. So um, our foreign minister finally went on the record to say that, uh, that climate change is a risk to the international peace and security and that a preventative foreign policy is needed. So there is some buy-in, let's say, at, the, at, the, at least at the rhetorical level. The question is, how exactly um, does climate change impact on, on international peace and security? Um, and the first thing to say is probably that it doesn't directly cause conflict um, uh, because the direct impacts of climate change are on, on ecosystems, which then impact on, uh, on livelihood, uh, livelihoods and socioeconomic conditions, which then impact on social conditions and politics, which then might slide into, uh, into violence. But that's 
a pretty long um, impact chain along which there's quite a bit of, of human agency. Um, but what we can say is that climate change can intensify conflict, uh, conflict drivers, so it can make a conflict more likely, um, uh, it can deepen it, it can prolong it, and thereby make it overall harder to sustain peace. And turning this around into a, into a slightly more positive um, narrative would be to say, well, that also means that addressing these, these climate change related security risks is an important dimension of the whole sustaining peace agenda and of, of prevention and stabilization. So um, the, the, the diplomatic challenge in this is to, you know, um, to consider all these destabilizing effects which are already there but which are growing in the future and which sort of threaten to overburden the um, um, the system and uh, and instead to help find uh, hide find solutions. So not only deal with the conflicts of today, but also find ways uh, to deal uh, to think about and, and and contain the conflicts of of tomorrow. So basically, um, the the impact chain is that climate security matters because it has huge impact on human security, um, and these then have. Um, impacts on, 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 on geopolitical risks. Um, let's say if the monsoon were to fail in India, you know, what, how can the Indian government react and potentially it might, uh, you know, it might deflect, try to deflect blame um, uh, from, from bad management by, by starting international issues and, and suddenly you have, you have this um, geopolitical crisis. Um, but the problem is that Although there is this awareness that you know the um, the survey among the uh, by the World Economic Forum uh, shows um, there isn't really anyone who who owns this who owns this issue. Um, of course, you have the climate community, and it has its home in the in the UN uh, UNFCCC negotiations, um, and they are aware of the security risks, and they might even try to leverage these to to emphasize that climate change is not just uh, an environmental uh, threat, but an existential one, um, but obviously their negotiations are already difficult enough, um, so they will certainly resist bringing violent conflict into them and they don't have a mandate for this um, as well. And then you have on the other hand the security community which has its sort of ultimate home in the UN Security Council and well they feel they already have uh, enough on their plans with uh, on their hands with the ongoing conflict so no need for adding climate change on which there are no experts and um, and, and more potential conflicts on which they can then fail too, let's put it that way. So they're not, they're not interested in, um, in that. And therefore, this, this, even though many people see the risks, there's no one who's really taking care of them. Um, and I will stop here on the threat side, but not before um, giving a glimpse into what the response side would need to look like. Because given that the impact of the, of the impact chain is so long, uh, there are also lots of opportunities for, for strengthening resilience. So it's not just about mitigating climate change, but of course that's part of it. Uh, it's also about building resilient infrastructure, so it's also about strengthening and diversifying livelihoods, and it's also about strengthening conflict management um, institutions to be able to deal with these impacts. So the bottom line is that we have to use our efforts on, on, on adaptation to also help build peace and vice versa. Uh, just as, uh, as, as EcoPeace is doing, in fact. And I just want to say a few words on the, on, on the second narrative, so that climate action is, uh, is also an opportunity, um, because we have to remember the fact that, uh, you know, it's not just about foregoing consumption and, and preventing doomsday. Uh, sometimes the narrative that it can help the, mer uh, the world, ma make the world a better place is also uh, quite, quite important. And so just this one slide on sort of the co-benefits of, 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 of climate action for health, economy, society, and we should add, um, you know, peace and uh, more equal development opportunities without the distortions that the reliance on, on fossil fuels uh, uh, bring about. And maybe just to say something on health, um, you know, there was a big epidemiological study some three years ago on the costs of air pollution. Uh, which was calculated to lead to some 7 million premature deaths per year globally and I think about 45,000 uh, in Germany. And if you compare this with uh, to COVID-19, 
Um, that's a lot of people dying. And, but there was very, very little debate about this. So it's, um, it was just presented as another civilization risk that we cannot really avoid. And I don't want to play one threat against the other, but the point is that the, um, the greater air pollution also seems to have a significant effect on morbidity related to COVID-19. So it just shows that being more ambitious on climate action and thereby um, you know, reducing air pollution could have also helped um, uh, with, the, with, with the current crisis. And so by way of conclusion, just a quick overview of the points that I at least wanted to make, uh, I hope I have made. Um, the first one being that you know, the climate crisis is, is, is not just about environment, but it also has these implications for international peace and security, which we can already see, but which will increase over the coming decades. Um, that you know, the primary responsibility for maintaining international peace and security lies with the UNSC, so they have to pick this up. The security implications of climate change uh, will eventually end up um, on their desks anyway, so it's, so it's better to prepare. And lastly, um, there's obviously great opportunity in, in combining climate adaptation, development and peace building efforts. And I, I'm assuming that Erica might explore this a, a bit further in the, in the next presentation. But before that, um, I think there's an opportunity for questions and comments to which I look forward. And I've also put some links to further resources on this slide for those who want to explore it a little further. Thank you very much. Thank you, Benjamin. That was really, really interesting. Uh, if you want, you can sh uh, stop sharing the screen. Uh, yeah. So now it's uh, time for question and answers. We already received a few questions. Uh, the first one being by our uh, Israeli co-director, Gideon Broberg. He's asking, Benjamin, you mentioned the need for diplomacy. Is diplomacy only for diplomats, or is there a role for many actors, including civil society? Thank you for your question, Gideon. Benjamin. Um, yeah, Gideon, uh, I think we, we, we perfectly agreed that no, this is, uh, you know, dip diplomacy is something that's, uh, that is for, for, for many other actors, uh, certainly for professional diplomats, but also for, um, you know, it's spreading uh, throughout all branches of government. Uh, you know, there's diplomacy in all, in all at, at all levels, but also certainly something to do for uh, for for for, uh, for civil society and for for citizens uh, um, to do. And I, I think I mean EcoPeace is sort of the the primary example of 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 how to put this into practice by trying to build sort of uh, local grassroots connections and, and and trying to link these issues um, at the local level and 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 help to build um, uh, you know to have synergies between peace building and, and um, environmental protection. Thank you. I also have other questions here. Um, Farah Hegazi, sorry if I, I mispronounced some of your uh, last names, from Cipri. Do you think interest in climate change and security at the Security Council is increasing? There have been a few area meetings on this and you're starting to see climate change and the security threat coming to the mandates of UN peace uh, keeping mission. Is this all superficial? I think that is also a very interesting question. Um, yeah, I, 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 and I think, I think the, the, the response is um, somewhere in between. I, I do think there's, a, there's an increasing interest and there's an ever greater number of countries which have, um, which have uh, sort of uh, expressed themselves on this and have supported uh, this, uh, the, um, the idea of the UN Security Council taking action. If you look at the last big debate on this issue by the Dominican Republic in, in January 2019. I think there was more than 80 delegations taking the floor and um, a lot of them at ministerial level. So there is this interest. At the same time, we all know that there's a few countries who are not so convinced and that it's um, an uphill struggle, especially with, the, uh, with some of the permanent members for good reasons and bad reasons. I mean, the good reasons are that they, that they want to you know, that they want to focus on, on, on operational effects. And so they say bringing in the, the really big issues uh, just makes it makes it harder and it can result in blah 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 um but uh, you know that's that's not a reason um uh, i mean that that that's a good reason for, for for trying to say uh we are um we need to focus on on what we where we can actually um achieve things but it's 
um, it's no good reason for closing your eyes in front of what is what is going to come. Um, and so I think the, the international system is picking up on this. There's also in terms of the of the international organizational bureaucracies, they are increasingly interested as they see the member states being increasingly interested and they're sort of trying to figure out how to best respond to this and how to actually be able to sort of translate the siloed structure that they have inherited and which are very often inherent in their mandates into something that uh, that that can better that can better collaborate but i i still think it's um it's it's early days because it's uh, there's there's quite a bit of raising awareness already and um i think there's indeed been progress with um having it um, embedded into a number of, of, of UN mandates. That's a very important progress that, that, uh, that, that Sweden pushed for in the, uh, in, in the past years and, and others have, uh, have pushed for as well. But it hasn't yet translated into, into sufficient action. Thank you, Benjamin. Just uh, this is my curiosity. Uh, in your experience, do you see that there is a, a combination like um, a between like the perception, the public perception of climate change and the willingness of governments to act uh, on climate change issues? Sorry, I didn't quite... Is the, the, the public perception of climate change, yeah. does, does it influence uh, the willingness of governments? Abs to... I mean, absolutely, there's, a, there's no doubt in the, that there's a, that governments make a calculation of sort of, okay, is there, is there a political mileage in this or, or, or is there not? But I think it's, it's one, of the, one of the general problems with, with a lot of, of, of sort of public goods that everyone would benefit from governmental action, but some um, groups would also lose. And the, these groups uh, are often very much better organized and we see this in Germany. So there's a, there's a lot of support in principle for climate action, but uh, once you have, um, once it begins to sort of touch on, on various lobbies, um, interests, then of course the pushback is, uh, is, uh, is quite hard and people fight much harder than they fight for the, uh, for the general uh, common good. Thank you. We have many questions. I'm trying to combine two. We have one from Anthony Akpan. What is the implication of climate change impact and security in Africa? Um, Anthony from Nigeria and Erika uh, Manueli from Italy. She's asking where are the main climate change hotspots? and how are they going to affect global security? So maybe I'll combine these two. Yeah, and these two can be combined. I think um, obviously um, it's, um, Africa will be, is, is one of the places, uh, and, or many, many regions of Africa, of Africa are, are, are the places where, where, where the pressures from both sides are particularly, uh, particularly strong. Um, I, I'm always a little skeptical of making hotspot maps because um, the, the, the question is not so much, to my mind, where the indicators are, are sort of where they overlap, which of course you can show and gives you a first idea, but it's very often the interaction between sort of uh, climate impacts and, 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 and peace and security challenges that is, that is, um, uh, that is decisive. And that interaction is, it depends really on the, on, on, on the local context, or on the regional context. And so it's really hard to to make this um, to make this uh, sort of hierarchy because it it really depends on on on, on many things that, that cannot easily be uh, prioritized. But of course, it's in the areas that are uh, that combine a strong vulnerability because they, there's many people depending on on climate sensitive livelihoods with a sort of pre existing fragility. So um, governance mechanisms which are not very good at protecting people or which even rely on um, sort of uh, divide, and, uh, divide and rule at, uh, tactics that include violence. Obviously, it's in these areas that you have the, that you have the biggest um, um, challenges. But it's, it's really hard to sort of, uh, you know, compare, okay, let's say the Somalia with, as, as, as one of the examples with, let's say, Vanuatu as, a, uh, as an island that is, that is going to, to disappear because they don't quite they're not, uh, you know, they're not exactly the same levels, and there's a great diversity in the security impacts of, of, of climate change. Thank you. And no one is, and maybe I should add that no one is, uh, no one is secure from them. It even has impacts in uh, in, 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 the, in developed countries. Uh, I'll try to combine other two questions. One from Ida Mayenberg, Germany University of Passau, 
and one from Laura Fisher, also a former intern uh, uh, at EcoPeace and now Peace Research Institute Frankfurt. They are both asking about uh, what are the alternatives. So basically, Ida is asking what are the propositions to support the, the other narrative uh, to make more visible and attractive for society. And Laura is asking, um, uh, since we can observe that obligations are not met, uh, do you consider alternative instruments to global politics and diplomacy? Um, maybe to the first question, I mean, it's, uh, I think the, <laughs> the proof is in, in, in the doing, in, 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 in trying to, 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 uh, to push this narrative and, and, and to make that argument that actually, you know, the world could be, the world is good and it's, it's in many respects, it's, it's actually getting better, not the environmental degradation, but in other, uh, but we can make it even better and that, and that there is a, that there's a, huge co-benefits, as I said, for example, in reducing air pollution and reducing, uh, uh, reducing emissions in order to reduce air pollution, in order to reduce um, uh, morbidity and, so, uh, and while sort of protecting um, uh, the, the planet from, from, from future climate impacts. So I think, it, and from, from the, from the socio-economic and political and uh, consequences and the violence that might, that might stem from them, I think, I think that's, uh, you know, it, it's just something that needs to be that needs to be fleshed out. I, the problem is obviously that a lot of our reporting and a lot of our sort of um, media analysis is, uh, seems to be so threat focused, that, and that's why you know these are the narratives that sort of um, dominate. And then on the supply side, uh, as as a think tank, you know that we that we also push because there seems to be a, a greater demand for them, but they need to be um, sort of. Uh, yeah, co combined with uh, with the other narratives that also emphasize, no, this is you know what what's the world we want to live in in in, in 2050, and you know it may uh, include various aspects that are um, you know that are that that provide benefits across ho a whole range of um, of uh, of aspects of society. Now I forgot the second question. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, the second question was about what other instruments can be developed, uh, considering that obligations are often not met. And I think it's also the point of another question from Angela Godfrey Goldstein, which is, is also asking something similar. How do, what, we, what can we do since we cannot uh, actually enforce uh, states to, to comply? Yeah, I think uh, you know, in the, in many ways, it's. Um, I, I think the the enforcement option was uh, was tried with the Kyoto Protocol, and it uh, let's say it, it failed. Like this, this didn't this didn't work. The states didn't make sufficient commitments, and those that did then basically said, "Oh well, um, maybe not." Uh, whenever it uh, whenever it didn't suit them anymore. So I think the, uh, the 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 shift towards the Paris logic of saying, "Well." Let's ask everyone what they can contribute, and let's sort of build from uh, build from bottom up where's where's necessary. Even even though you know, um, uh, from a European perspective, where you always sort of insist on international legal order, of course it would be much nicer if you had a if you had a if you had a very nice structure where you know this is what exactly you're allowed to do, and and, and here's where we're going. Um, but I I, it, I also don't think it's necessary that we necessarily get there. Primarily by a, by a sort of um, uh, sanctions of uh, of one you know one way or another. I think in the end, it's a question: Do we have an alternative um, uh, economic model and an alternative uh, model of 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 of, um, of energy production that is more attractive? And once we have that, um, there's sort of uh, you know the, the the old model just uh, will fade away. Um, and so there's a lot of scope for um, for individual action at the country level, but even below that, by trying to to develop these attractive models and and, and then showcasing them, and then maybe you don't uh, you know if for your energy production you can just do it just just use the sun which is always there. You don't need to dig up coal and and pollute your and, and destroy your landscapes and, and and pollute the air. And once that's even che once that's cheaper to top uh, on top, well then uh, you know. And there won't be that many who insist on digging up coal to make a loss. Um, so I think it's uh, a, a lot of that can be achieved, but of course, it what is still needed is sort of a focus at 
at political level, even if we cannot get this at global level, then um, then some of the uh, at least some of the influential countries need to need to take a lead and push for that. And so it was very helpful that the new uh, European Commission said, "Oh, we are going to make a priority out of this." I hope they 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 follow through on this, and because we're already hearing all these lobby interests that I mentioned before, trying now with the with the. Uh, with the economic impact that we already have to deal with, let's postpone. And hopefully we don't that. Hopefully we don't do that. Hopefully we'll use the opportunity and say, okay, let's build back uh, better, as they say. Yes, and I invite everyone here to have a look at our water energy nexus, which suggests actually an alternative model for energy production. Uh, and uh, with this, I think we should move to the second uh, presentation. Benjamin, thank you so much. I think if we're going to have a few minutes at the end, maybe we can take a few more questions. Uh, but I think we should move to Erika. Erika, I invite you to sure. uh, share thank you. your... Thank you. To uh, activate your video, if you can. Erika? I'm not sure because someone else turned off the video. Uh, okay. Start, start video. The host stopped it, so... Yes, I did. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, and I don't know how to <laughs> show you again, but in the meantime, maybe someone can help me from my colleagues. In the meantime, I'll say a few words. There we about go. Okay. You done? Yes. Yes, thank you. So uh, Erika uh, Wentel, she's a professor of... Uh, environmental Policy and Public uh, Policy at the Nicholas School of Environment, Duke University. She specializes in global environmental politics, environmental security, with a particular emphasis on water and energy. Current areas of research include global environmental politics, governance, environmental conflict and peace building, the political economy of resource course, and climate change adaptation. She has also uh, written different uh, books, including State Making and Environmental Cooperation, Linking Domestic Politics and International Politics in uh, Central Asia, which received the 2003 uh, Chadwick Elder Prize and 2003 Lethem Keith Caldwell Prize. A, she's a good friend of Ecopies, and I'm very happy that she's going to go through uh, what actually environmental peace building is, which is what we are doing at Ecopies and providing us uh, practical examples of what environmental peace building means. So here I, I give you the virtual stage. Okay, I'm gonna try to share my screen. Um, let's see, share. That worked, right? Okay, so um, good morning, good day to everyone. Um, I um, have been asked, I guess, to have sort of a big task of providing a um, overview of what is environmental peace building by talking about some of the theories and some of the lessons learned from the field of environmental peace building with a few caveats. Given that we've already heard about climate change, I am probably not going to talk about climate change, even though it is integral to the field of environmental peace building. Um, but I want to do one, um, one thing before I go into the material from environmental peace building is just to say a few words about the Environmental Peace Building Association. Um, largely because this is a new association, we are celebrating our second year um, of coming into existence of forming as a group of academics, practitioners, um, a community of researcher students all interested in this intersection between natural resources and the environment on one hand and conflict, peace, and security on the other hand. Um, we, um, the bottom picture just shows the first conference that took place last year at UC Irvine. And the um, motivation behind the association is really to bring together um, all of us who are interested in this topic to foster knowledge, build capacity, and strengthen relationships, both in person and virtually. Um, and just to give you a sense, the membership is spread across the world. 
um, over 62 countries, over 400 members. And just to note that EcoPeace um, was one of the founding members of the association and Adelphi is also an institutional member of um, the Environmental Peace Building Association. And I will come back to it at the end um, just for places to learn more about the field. So where I'm gonna start in talking about environmental peace building, and again, I just want to um, note that this work comes out of the activities and research of a large collection of actors, and I'm probably not going to acknowledge many of them, but um, this one diagram comes out of a report from UNEP on addressing the role of natural resources in conflict and peace building that pulled together a decade of work that was spearheaded by UNEP, but also um, in collaboration with organizations like Eldelphi, the Environmental Law Institute, um, IISD, um, and academics, including myself, other colleagues at UC Irvine, Columbia, and um, elsewhere. And the idea was to really look at this relationship between natural resources and the environment along the entire conflict um, continuum or the peace and security continuum and to really understand where there were different risks to peace and security from the role of natural resources and where there were opportunities for building peace through a focus on natural resource management and the environment. And that really, um, the latter is really where EcoPeace has chartered new ground, new territory in leveraging um, the environment as a tool for peace building and diplomacy. Um, one of the points I wanna make in thinking about this continuum is, and talking about the theories about environmental peace building, is there is no one theory. I just wanna make that clear from the beginning in that there is no magic bullet. There are multiple pathways in which the environment can be leveraged as a tool for peace building, but there are also multiple ways in which natural resources and the environment can be used to fuel conflict and to sustain conflict and also to disrupt um, efforts for peace building. Um, also context matters, that um, one needs to look at the particular context in trying to conceptualize different ways that natural resources and the environment can play a role in building peace. And at, you know, one of the um, notions of this continuum is the end point is really fostering sustainable development. So this also links into the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Um, where it all began, um, which is now over a decade ago, even more, was with this initial report, this foundational report that laid out the linkages from conflict to peace building. And some of the important lessons that we learned from this report and looking at cases, really digging into the different cases, was that over a period of 60 years, there were at least 40% of conflicts that were linked to natural resources. And these conflicts, where you had conflicts linked to natural resources, you often were more likely to have a relapse um, within five years. And when looking at um, what happens at war's end, what transpires when negotiating peace agreements, we found that less than 25% of these agreements that had a conflict that was linked to natural resources included natural resource provisions. And so this is something that is really important for those working in environmental negotiations, diplomacy, um, with links to the peace and security community, is looking at the natural resource sector at war's end and trying to understand the role it can play in bringing countries and communities out of conflict and helping to restore livelihoods and foster economic development. Um, just to give you a sense of what this looks like, if you looked at 18, of, you know, we looked at a large number of conflicts, but of the conflicts since 1990 that were fueled by natural resources, and the ones that had links to natural, you know, links to natural resources, they often had um, resources that were more high value extractives, um, resources such as oil, diamonds, um, timber, um, minerals, copper, gold. What we don't see is water. And so this is something that's really interesting when I go through some of the examples, this variation that exists between the extractives 
and water and the type of resource that may matter in thinking about the linkages between environment and conflict. And so the point here that I really wanna make is the type of resource matters um, in, in thinking about these linkages and pathways between conflict and peace building, um, but also um, context matters to depending, you know, what, the, what country um, exists. And one of the other points I want um, to underscore is that, you know, natural resources, they play different roles in this conflict cy um, cycle but they also um, affect countries differently. And often it is the, um, where we're, um, many countries that are most at risk are fragile states. And I just want to, at the end, if we have time for Q&A, to really think through the links for COVID-19 for many of these countries that um, are conflict affected what is it going to mean to add another layer of complexity in trying to think through the relationship between natural resources and environment for peace building? So if we go to the conflict cycle and we think about extractives and livelihoods, to start there first before turning to water, um, just from an academic point, we often look at this through the lens of the resource curse. And this is this notion of countries that are richly endowed with um, oil, gas, minerals should do better economically and those that are less endowed will do worse. And the paradox is countries with abundant oil and gas have not done as well economically, have been much more at risk for conflict. And we've seen the role that countries that have an abundance of natural resources, how um, diamonds or cocoa or rare minerals have helped to fuel conflicts. But often what happens is they help to sustain conflicts even more. So what you see in places um, like Sierra Leone and other places is that these high value resources have been used to finance militaries, to finance the conflict. They also affect the social fabric of society by, um, create, by not building a social contract with society because they don't need to tax their populations. Um, so understanding, you know, the causes of conflict is on the one hand really important, but then thinking about what does it mean when you're moving from conflict to peace building? What does it mean that the conflict was fueled by extractives? How does that then play into rebuilding? And often there's this sense that, oh, the extractives are a quick source of revenue. Um, you get this myopic short-term thinking that you can use extractives to kickstart economic growth, create jobs, generate revenues. But the point that um, I want to make and that comes out from the literature and a, a large array of case studies that were conducted as part of this larger body of work in environmental peace building is that you need to consider both renewables and non-renewables in the post-conflict phase or, and for peace building. And largely this is because minerals and the extractives never live up to expectations as the quick fix. And livelihoods matter. Most, of the, most populations are often employed in the agricultural sector. So there is a need to think about diversifying the economy and thinking about um, a broader set of livelihood opportunities. Um, and you know, when we talk about livelihood resources, we're talking about those that people need to survive and the process by which they obtain and utilize these resources. So in many places where the extractives are seen as the quick fix, they also have detrimental impacts on water resources, and which affects in soil. And so really trying to think about how do you restore livelihoods in these contexts should be put front and center. Um, you know, one of the lessons that also comes out of this literature on the resource curse is transparency and information matters. This is often where civil society comes into play, where communities can be empowered um, to really help play a role in mitigating corruption. So this notion of how do you improve transparency and revenue flows, how to make governments more accountable, um, but also by improving transparency, you can help to manage public expectations about who is benefiting and how communities are benefiting. Um, one of the other issues that um, is also really important is thinking about who sits at the table. In negotiations at conflict and um, or in the peace building process. 
Um, usually it is, you know, state leaders, it's former, um, you know, um, militants. What about, what we also found it's really important to empower women to have them have a seat at the table along with other community members. Um, just to give an example from the Middle East on the importance of restoring livelihoods, um, in Iraq, um, you know, oil was seen as, again, a quick fix for rebuilding the economy, but water was also um, fundamental for restoring livelihoods and ecosystem services, especially for the marshland families in Iraq. The marshlands provide an important source of food, livestock, fisheries, they use the reeds for housing and transportation. So really looking at ecosystems and livelihoods, the role of water in the peace building process. Turning to water, um, one of you know, the books that I worked on as part of this larger body of literature on um, post-conflict peace building um, was this focus on water. And this is available online, so any of these um, resources can be found online. There is this um, assumption when we think about water, because it is an, often it is an international resource, crosses boundaries, it can be both international boundaries, local boundaries, that water is more likely to foster conflict. But as we know from the literature, and especially the work of scholars like Aaron Wolf, that water is more likely to be a source of peace building. And this is really, again, where EcoPeace has demonstrated the importance of bringing people together to talk about water issues. So water is an entry point, um, more than any other resource, um, is what we found. Water is a catalyst for fostering dialogue, for building confidence, trust among communities, um, helping um, demonstrate shared interests between states, but also communities. So um, a case study that we often use is the Sava River Basin um, in that crossed boundaries in the former Yugoslavia, because this was one of the first areas where um, communities could come together in states after the conflict to outline new areas for cooperation. Um, water has played a role in Central Asia, an area that I've worked on as an entry point for bringing um, states together to prevent conflict. There was in a sense that these states would um, engage in conflict after the collapse of the Soviet Union, but water served as a way to maintain dialogue, but an area that Julia also mentioned that's really important, it also highlighted the importance of thinking intersectorally about water, energy, agricultural issues. Um, you know, the Israel-Jordan Peace Treaty is another example that has, um, where water has played a role in helping to, um, to build and develop and deepen relationships between Israel and Jordan. Water was part of the treaty. And what's important here is this notion of creating these joint water committees, the exchange of information at the interstate level, but then the role that EcoPeace has played at the community level. Um, the, what I want to conclude with is just where we're seeing new directions happening um, in the field of environmental peace building is with the ongoing conflicts in the Middle East, we're actually seeing a return to where the field began, that the environment and associated infrastructure has become a target um, of conflict in many of the wars, going back to the first you know, Gulf War, again with the marshlands in Iraq being drained, um, but also we're seeing infrastructure um, being explicitly targeted, such as power plants. And this has direct implications for where we are today with thinking about COVID-19. What happens when electricity goes out? What does this mean for managing water purification systems? What does it mean for managing wastewater? What are the impacts for contamination of water supplies, collapse of public health systems, and the spread of waterborne illnesses? So these are areas that I um, would say need to be um, brought back into the discussion of environmental peace building if you look at the entire conflict um, cycle. And just some final thoughts. Um, you know, there are things that have you know, there are themes that are cross-cutting. Um, one is governance. You cannot talk about 
environmental peace building without thinking about governance um, at multiple levels uh, because conflict disrupts state institutions. So part of this is rebuilding state institutions, thinking about policy coordination, thinking about social relationships between different users, thinking about gender sensitivity, again, creating an inclusive um, dialogue for managing natural resources and building a sustainable peace. Um, and, you know, at the end, what it, should one ha have a focus on rights-based approaches, water rights, land tenure, access, you know, is water a human right, um, adaptive governance, and that brings back um, climate change into the discussion. Um, if anyone is interested really in digging deeply into this topic, I would suggest you could go online right now and take the MOOC that was developed with UN Environment through the Environmental Peace Building Association, um, where you will have access to lots of lectures, lots of case studies. Um, and then I'm just going to do a plug for another webinar that's coming out with the Environmental Peace Building Association, the Interest Group on Water, where Gidon Bromberg, um, the Israeli director of EcoPeace, will be speaking on water sanitation and COVID-19 um, and cooperation in the Middle East. And so I am happy to stop there and um, move to questions, Julia. Okay, thank you so much, Erica. It's very interesting actually to see from uh, an academic uh, point of view, how you describe environmental peace building while we are an equities working on the ground, uh, trying to, uh, to move uh, with practices, with actual concrete actions on the ground. And it's interesting to see how uh, um, from, a, from an academic perspective, this is, has been described. Um, I am afraid we're having some problems with questions and answers. Uh, Apparently, some people have told me they're trying to uh, write questions. Okay, so you can write the questions if you don't manage to write it in the question and answer box. I think uh, Amy, my colleague, has opened the, the chat, so you can also write it there. In the meantime... I'm seeing the Q&A starting yeah. to work. Again. I see, okay, so I see that it's working for some. So we have already a first question from Peter Sly. Is there academic studies of building governance structures where there are asymmetric sovereign governments? An example, Israel and Palestine, US states and Indian tribes. Um, yes, I mean, I think that's foundational to the study of governance and negotiations is recognizing asymmetry of power um, both in capabilities and interests. And this is often where anyone who studies negotiation theory looks at try the role of international mediators, um, negotiators in trying to offset some of those power asymmetries. Um, and, you know, eco peace plays a role in this at the local level, but there are, um, you know, Israel Palestine is a great case. There's people who've worked on hydro hegemony between, you know, looking at water basins. And there is lots of work on um, not just the United States with Native Americans, but also in Canada and thinking about how do you really decolonize um, natural resources and water um, sort of through the lens of indigenous politics and other studies. Uh, we have also another question that was uh, sent to us by email. Uh, environmental peace building theories and practices offer a broad examination of how to solve conflicts through a shared interest. Conflict, however, is place specific. How do these models and theories take into account the variances of conflict and thus how the, can the environment, environmental peace building approach be shifted from a global understanding to a place specific response? That's, I think, a very interesting question. Yeah, um, I think this is, you know, it's being highly sensitized to the specific context and not presuming that you can transport what worked in um, one context to another place. Um, and I think, you know, this is, you know, from my earlier work um, in Central Asia, having seen, you know, international 
I'm putting international lawyers on the spot. Um, you know, pilot, you know, just come into Central Asia with ideas of how water management should work without recognizing what was transpiring on the ground already. And, you know, this is, I think there's some interesting work that's taking place in the area of legal pluralism, recognizing that you can have multiple forms of governance structures that can coexist. And much of this requires stepping back and listening and really having a good sense of, you know, there are certain um, things that are required for good natural resource management, such as transparency, sharing of information, finding mechanisms to have people communicating, but they may look different in different contexts. And you may have multiple forms of governance that can coexist. Okay, thank you. I think I'll take the last question because we are running out of time. Uh, Jana Grave, Grieve, um, climate change, security issues are cross-border nature. However, a lot of programming policy making is still done with a national focus. How to overcome this by engaging and strengthening more the regional economic communities? And how to better engage neglected key stakeholders? You talked before about women. Um, and I think it's an important case. She's also mentioning indigenous communities as the case of Colombia, religious traditional leaders, and so on. And this was the last question for today. Yeah, um, you know, we live in a world of nation states, um, for good and for bad. Um, right now, we're seeing, I think, some of the negative sides of, you know, having nation states be the drivers of policy. Uh, because often where we've seen many of the most innovative policies and best examples or where we've drawn lesson learned has been where communities have been at the forefront. So many of the communities that have, say, um, you know, in the edited volume on water and post-conflict peace building, um, you know, in the Kivus and elsewhere, it was women who were able to come to the table to find solutions between communities on how best to water, manage water because they understood the problems. They understood the needs of their families, of the children, of what was required, and they were able to put those needs first. Um, and it is opening up that space and just making sure that when organizations work, that they are, that they are um, sensitive to being inclusive and to having a particip participatory approach to managing natural resources. Um, and you know, overall, it is really having a much more nested understanding of governance structures. That you, you know, one set of governance is you know, right relying on the nation state, especially in countries that are fragile and have weak institutions we may not address the critical needs that need to be addressed at war's end or in a peace building context. And so trying to empower um, though, you know, communities, um, especially women, may be what is needed um, in the short term as you strengthen other governance institutions. Well, thank you so much is uh, for, so for uh, respect of the time of everyone here, I think we can close it here. I really want to thank uh, both Benjamin and uh, Erica for their participation. Uh, it was really interesting to hear from you and I hope everyone has enjoyed. Uh, I invite everyone to follow us on Facebook, all social media and check our website uh, for more information. And we're going to uh, organize a second webinar probably next month. So we will uh, um, send you the details for, for the next one. Thank you everyone again. Have a good uh, evening or a day in case of Erica. And uh, that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you for Thank you. listening. Bye everyone.